brings me such joy to be able to deliver you such good news. And Marvel fans have needed this in particular. Star Wars and DC fans, hopefully your day will come soon. Uh, although Star Wars fans are really, some of some, some are really enjoying Ahsoka. Star Wars and DC have really fractured their fandoms, much to their detriment. Marvel, I don't really know if Marvel has fractured their fandom as it, I think more just kind of like lost its way. So to see them back on track is very exciting. And I think that's why they're back on track sooner because it's easier to get back on track. They just have to go back to doing what they were doing in the first place. And Loki season two feels very much like not only a return to form, but a significant advancement as well. It's got everything. So yes, Loki season two is, in a word, glorious. Oh boy. And as I tweeted last night when the social media embargo lifted, Disney Plus now has an HBO level quality show to go with their fancy new HBO drop time. Ah, oh, so good. This new Loki does indeed remind me of House of the Dragon, The Last of Us, and the better seasons of Westworld. Not only in the quality and that a lot happens, but it has that it has the production values and also the darker, more sophisticated tone. It's darker. Oh, it's darker. And you know I like me some dark entertainment. I mean, Loki, he really leans into the anti-hero this season. Ah, but don't worry. This is a non-spoiler review. And that's crucial because in this Disney Plus show, uh, in this Disney Plus show, as I just said, a lot of stuff happens actually each episode. I know. And the episodes, at least one through four of six, Marvel is holding back uh, the last two from press at the moment, but so far, they're all a little over 40 minutes, not including credits. And you know on streaming shows, credits can be quite long, sometimes up to 10 minutes. Uh, so, so you're getting a lot of bang for your buck. It's just fantastic. And again, just what Disney Plus and Marvel need right now. So going into this show, oh, I was nervous to click that first screener. My worries were immediately melted away. But clicking that first screener, whoo, because Marvel is not only coming off of their lowest point ever, like lower than anyone could think Marvel would ever sink, like Secret Invasion, how did that happen? I still don't understand it, considering it's one of the best Marvel storylines in the comics of all time. But also, in addition to coming up, I mean, we thought quantum maniac things couldn't get worse. Oh, but we hadn't seen Secret Invasion. Uh, it's weird. It's, it's whiplash, but in a good way to go from their worst to, I would say, pretty much their best. This, to me, is as good as Endgame. And I, Endgame is my favorite to date. <laughs> Loved Endgame. Some of you might like Infinity War better. I don't understand you, but I, I, I think you'll like this too. But also, Loki for season two had lost its season one creative team. Now, losing Michael Waldron, you know, after Multiverse of Madness, this horrible script, who cares? Good riddance. But to lose director Kate Herron, who'd done all six episodes of season one, devastating. Ah, oh, maybe that's what really scared me. And who the heck are these new guys? Head writer Eric Martin, who did a little writing on season one, and lead directing duo uh, Justin Benson and Aaron uh, Moorhead. They don't direct every episode like Kate Heron did, but they take on the bulk and they're kind of leading the, leading the way for all the directors. Now, these three guys have done some stuff. There isn't, this isn't their first rodeo, but they haven't really defined themselves creatively. They've never like had ownership of a rodeo, let's say. Uh, but at least they didn't come from Rick and Morty, so they had that going for them, so that was good. And interestingly, if you look at their resumes, they all have a little bit of horror in their background, and there's an element of horror to Loki season two. Maybe that's partially what gives it that HBO feel. Uh, again, this is a non-spoiler review, so I'll just say that they push the edge of the envelope as far as they can, and then even a little bit more so. Sometimes the way they get around it is they do something absolutely horrible and disgusting, but they just don't show it. So it's up to the actor to convey what happened with their facial expressions, because Marvel and Disney Plus won't let them show it. But, uh, and they had, I think they could have turned up a little bit on the sound effects, but it was there. But they come close to what Sam Raimi hinted at at moments in Multiverse of Madness. And we've all suspected that maybe Ra Ra uh, uh, Raimi could have done a better job on Multiverse of Madness if he'd not only watched some of the source material, uh, but also if he maybe hadn't been so restricted. Uh, also, so, so some of this stuff is pretty shocking. Like episode four is the very shocking episode. They actually got me to gasp out loud on that one. I mean, there was more than one moment where I was like, whoa, whoa. 
But uh, I, I couldn't believe it. I actually gasped out loud. They, they shocked me. I did not see that coming. And the show, as I said, just looks absolutely tremendous. Again, more like an HBO show than a Disney Plus show. Extravagant, detailed sets. I'm like, you built all of this? It's, glor- it's glorious. Oh, that's, the, that's the tagline for season two. I'm telling you, glorious. You'll just be looking at your screen shouting, glorious, glorious, over and over. Lots of VFX, not a ton. You can see a little bit of the restraint because it's a streaming show, but they use it where it's extremely effective and they have some big set pieces. Uh, And I think that the writing, it's good writing, so it makes up for not always having as much VFX as a movie would. Also, Loki's VFX are kind of subtle, so that benefits the show. And Tom Hiddleston's eyes are like a VFX. I never, I, are they actually that green? It was interesting, because of course, Loki is green's color, and you're, they, they really use Tom Hiddleston's eyes a lot on this show. We'll talk about him more in a moment. Uh, but it also, it just feels, so they have those big Marvel moments, and it feels more like an extended movie, which is what the best streaming shows feel like. The episodes are so good, I'll just tell you. I didn't even want to look down at my dinner while I was eating while watching my screeners because I was worried I was going to miss something cool. I looked down once and I missed something cool. I had to rewind and I'm like, just like, I'm not going to do that again because this is amazing. I mean, it's great. It's really, really cool. Uh, It's also great to have an OG Marvel character front and center again. For all the new, you know what I'm talking about, for all the new characters that Kevin Feige has introduced since Endgame, and there have been a lot, I think many of us feel too many, still, All these new characters, and I think because the time isn't being taken to introduce them properly, none of them hit like the originals do. Uh, Maybe uh, Oscar Isaac's Moon Knight to a degree, because, you know, his multiple personality is just so interesting. Uh, I guess I kind of like the Tom Hiddlestons and the Oscar Isaacs, too. All right, so anyway. Uh, And with Tom Hiddleston continuing to be a guardian for Loki on and off camera, you can feel that ownership and purpose. Unlike some of his former co-stars, Hiddleston's been out in the Hollywood wilds and he has accepted that there's really nothing out there for him. (laughs) You can see some other Marvel actors struggling and saying, I'm the star of a major Marvel franchise. I must be able to have a movie career. And Hollywood's like, actually, no. Uh, They're all struggling, all of them, every single one. But Tom, so Tom Hiddleston has been like the only one to just accept it. and although to be fair, I would also add that I've never I've seen Hiddleston in other projects, and I think he's never come alive like he does when playing Loki. I've never and even season one he was great, and he was great in the movies. But like you haven't seen nothing yet with Tom Hiddleston's Loki acting until you've seen season two. So realizing that Hollywood had nothing for him, he came back to Marvel, and he's now fighting to make Loki his legacy. He loves this job. He loves this. He loves and respects this gig, and that's the sweet spot for this stuff. And Tom, you're doing amazing, sweetheart. Wow. His emotions, as I said, are right on the surface this season with some tremendous face and eye acting. Oh, he's just a a whirlwind of emotion and he takes you along with him. One moment he's excited, one moment he's sad. He's going to cry so many times. You're like, my goodness, someone give this man a tissue. I mean, it's great. He just hooks you. You're like right there. You're like, okay, all right, let's do this. And also his wardrobe, ah, me likey. From the tux to the pop collar, that jacket is fantastic, to the slim cut pants and that holster that he wears with, you know, for his knives, which he actually doesn't use very often, but the holster looks great. Loki is looking good. And also he has this incredible, he has his Loki swagger back. I love that Loki swagger. Sometimes I like to walk down the street like that. It's fun. And it's really great to see Loki uh, having fun. Perhaps the most exciting the most exciting thing about Loki season 2 on that note is that besides the quality of the show, Loki is allowed to be Loki. Ah, oh, how refreshing. He's darker this time, more villainous. And I mean, while he still wants to do good and he's still struggling with his dark side, that element of season 1 is still here. He's also starting to see the edge it can give him, the advantage his dark side gives him. And that's really cool. Let Loki be Loki. Uh, And also, as a god, that makes him an excellent fit with the TVA that likes to play god. And I thought that was really interesting to explore as well. Now, something else season two explores is that 
is the question of whether or not a bad guy can even be a good guy. Like, is redemption possible when you've done such horrible things? And again, so far, at least in episodes one through four, the ones I've seen, I'm really enjoying the exploration of that question. I feel it's very sophisticated, and the answer isn't an easy one, and I like that. Uh, while the directors, as I said, change up with the episodes, Eric Martin has written or co-writes all the episodes, and, th that, and therefore they feel very coherent with a strong through line. Now, I also know that there have been significant changes made to the, to the story, and the story substantially reworked. But like Rogue One, who the heck cares if it turns out this good? I'm thrilled with the results, again, at least so far with episodes one through four. And they didn't write out Jonathan Majors, or at least he's still a huge part of this show. And very effectively, I might add. Now, Kang, that shadow looms large over the entire season so far. But when Victor Timely first shows up, and he shows up, he shows up in a big way. He's not really there at the beginning of the show, but don't worry, Jonathan Majors is still very much a part of Loki's season two, for those of you who are uh, very big fans of his work. Uh, so, but when Victor Timely first showed up, I wasn't loving his performance. It was reminding me of Forrest Whitaker, speaking of Rogue One, a pr another performance which I feel is more for the actor's own amusement than to service the story as a whole. You're like, what are you doing? You seem like you're an entirely different project. But as timely story prog progressed, again, no spoilers, but I will say that I found, I ended up finding his character fascinating and I thought Major's performance became very compelling and emotional. I also was very moved by his work. Even if it still was a little disjointed, he still didn't quite fit, but maybe that's what he was trying to say because, you know, Kang and his variants are, are such, such bigger than life beings. All right, so anyway, another huge change is that this time it's the Loki and Mobius show rather than the Loki and Sylvie show. At least, again, in one through four, Mobius is in every episode with some lines that are so good one has to wonder if Owen Wilson improvised some of them. He's used incredibly well here. I have some friends who stopped watching Loki season one when Mobius kind of took a back seat. And I wonder if they're aware of that over at Disney Marvel because he's very much a front seat character this time. I wouldn't call Loki season two male centric because there are a lot of great female characters who have a lot of in incredible scenes. But I, so I would say instead it's more balanced between male and female characters than anything that's recently come out from Marvel and Star Wars. Uh, and there is a lot of male energy here with many scenes, I would say, being all guys. Although on the flip side, there are a couple scenes that are all women. So again, as I said, it's balanced. And I wonder if that will help the ratings as just a harsh truth is that the comic book fandom tends to be more male. Uh, but hopefully great female characters like this will continue to bring women over to the genre so it can be more balanced in the fandom. So anyway, as for Sylvie, I came to really like Sophie DiMartino's uh, version of Loki, and I definitely feel the spark between her and our Loki, and that spark is still there. But this season isn't really about Sylvie so much, and while she too is a constant in the episodes, she's not benched by any means, and she's used in very interesting ways, but the season so far uh, is not about progressing her and Loki's romance. You will see there are far more pressing matters at hand. Uh, this season two hits the ground running and never really lets up, at least so far. But speaking of Sylvie, ah, the product placement for McDonald's is amazing. I've never seen product placement like this. There is an end credit scene at the end of episode one. You're gonna wanna stick around for that. Well, it's a mid credit scene. Uh, and, but then, if you want to have your Loki McDonald's meal with the show, plan that for episode two. That's when you're going to want to have your McDonald's. If you, really, you can have McDonald's every episode if you want, but if you really want it to count, save it for episode two. This season, there's also Oscar winner uh, Kei Hui Kwan as basically the TVA's IT guy. Not enough can be said about how good he is on this show and what a boost he gives season two. Sure, he's incredibly well cast. Kudos for getting uh, Quan, uh, but he's also really bringing his A game. I mean, wow, he like if, you know everything everywhere all at once is clearly not a one-time thing. He is a phenomenal actor. I know Indiana Jones. Well, he's he's really good at what he does. I would say. I know Indiana Jones is played out now. Oh boy, is it played out. But they got to find a way to have Indiana Jones come back at least one more time with short round because Kei Hui Quan really shows here that when he d knows what he's doing and when he's allowed to do what he does so well, you know there's just no stopping him. He's incredible. As for supporting, uh, one, uh, Wunmi Musaku continues to cut a fierce figure as Hunter B-15. Those cheekbones, wow! 
But this time also gets to show her compassion. Her role has a little more uh, a dynamic to it this time. While Eugene Cordero, very much still supporting, uh, is still he's used better, even better this time around. They found some good stuff to do with him. Raphael Casal also joins the cast, and I gotta say, at first I thought he was an awful actor. I was like, how'd this guy get this gig? He's horrible. But as the season progressed, all I'll say is that he ended up being very well cast, and his character, who so many twists and turns. Keep an eye on this guy. And Miss Minutes, ah, oh my gosh, nothing can be said here. I don't want to spoil anything. I'll just say it gets super creepy in an awesome way. Wow, where they went with this, I was like, am I still watching Disney? And I was. Ho oh. ho! Uh, so I'm blown away by Loki season two. Again, at least episodes one through four. I hope they don't drop the ball with the final two, although I have tremendous faith in this creative team at this point, having seen episodes one through four. So it drops one episode per week. They just, on Thursday nights, and that's all they need, like the best HBO shows. You just need one to keep your audience glued to the screen and blown away. And this is a show you need to watch when it drops, you know, at six, uh, six well, as best you can. Treat it like an HBO show and the early days of Marvel Disney Plus shows. Appointment viewing, but even more, even more. It really, to me, plays like an HBO show that somehow found its way onto Disney+. Plus. It's great. So that's, and I'm very excited to see what it can hopefully do in the, in, the nine, in the 9 p.m. Thursday night space. I mean, this could be exciting. I see why they moved it to that, to Thursdays instead of Tuesdays. This is a Thursday night show. And I don't know if it's too late for Marvel and Disney+, Plus, but if anything can bring them out of their slump, it's Loki season two. So that's my non-spoiler review, and I'll see you back Thursday night after the episode airs so we can discuss episode one. Oh, we're going to have such a good time. All right, share your thoughts down below. Subscribe today so you're here for that breakdown. And of course, as always, you can check out some more videos right now.